Our sermon text this morning is Acts chapter 1, verse 14. That's Acts chapter 1, verse 14. All these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Let's pray. Lord, we gather today with your word and with your people, longing that your word would direct us in the way that you'd have us to go, that your word would be that which sets the trajectory for our church, that recalibrates us, that we might focus on those things that you mean for us to focus upon, that we might walk in obedience to your intention for us as your people. And so, Lord, we pray now for your help, that you might open our eyes to understand the word, and that you might uh, even prosper now the preaching of your word. Uh, Give us ears to hear now, and uh, hearts that long to do what your word calls us to. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, Today, uh, this week, we are really just one week away from Resurrection Day. Last week, we were remembering the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, this sermon is really just, we decided this year to do two sermons uh, that were kind of out of our ordinary study in the book of Hebrews. And uh, instead of doing a couple sermons leading up to Resurrection Day, we're doing a Resurrection Day sermon last week. And then this week, just sort of like what happened right after that. Right? And so last week we remembered that Jesus had died. And then in Luke 24, uh, it was recorded that Jesus rose again. And, and some people didn't expect it. They were surprised. They were, they were rejoicing, but they were surprised. And Jesus was busy telling them, well, if you'd understood the Old Testament, if you'd understood what Moses said and, and what the, the prophets had said and what the Psalms had said, if you, if you understood all of those, you would see that I had to die and rise again. And as a matter of fact, me dying and rising again was not only something that was taught, but something that was promised and I fulfilled it, Jesus said. I fulfilled what was taught in the Old Testament about me. And then we saw that Jesus challenged them then to not only see that him rising again uh, was part of the fulfillment, but also that the gospel was supposed to be preached to the nations. And that's what we talked about last week. And honestly, we're just going to keep moving on, as it were, uh, into the next section of the Bible that records in the book of Acts what the Lord did, uh, how he uh, gave direction to his church as he left them, and uh, also the ways in which those uh, people who uh, knew the Lord had given them work to do, how he worked in them a real sense of of their own dependence. Uh, They needed God's help. And one of the things we're going to focus on today, honestly, is is a a bit of a topic, a topical sermon. This is not uh, as common what we do around here, but this will be a little bit more topical sermon uh, on prayer. We're going to notice that there was a lot of praying uh, by the church uh, there in the book of Acts. And this sermon, honestly, is going to end with a little bit of a challenge for us to consider uh, ourselves and our own prayer practice. So that's just sort of where we're heading uh, in this text. So uh, we did read one verse uh, to start this, but honestly, this is just select text from the book of Acts. Uh, and I had big ambitions for this. I was going to, you know, in one week's time, I was going to really nail this all down and, you know, give, give the final word on prayer. Uh, you know how silly pastors are. I don't know if you know how silly pastors are, but sometimes we go, you know, set these great big goals. And, and I just I'm really uh, humbled by what I don't know. So I'm just going to say something <laughs> about prayer. How about that? How about just something? I hope it's true. Uh, and I hope it challenges us. And maybe this will leave, leave time to, to come back to this. Uh, many times in the weeks and months ahead. So, okay, so the first thing I want to highlight then in, uh, there's two real passages I want to spend a little bit of time with. The one that John just read for us, Acts chapter 1, uh, verses thir- uh, verse 14. But let me just give a little bit of, bit of context. Uh, 
The way we think about the book of Acts, some people uh, call, uh, t when they speak about Acts, they, they talk about the book of Luke Acts. Of course, Luke wrote Luke and Acts, and many people want to say, well, it's really kind of like one big book. It just, it's just keeps on going. And, and actually, if you look at the book of Acts, um, you know, the, the, the topics being discussed at the end of, chapter, of Luke 24, that's the last chapter in Luke, they just get picked right back up. It's, it, it's almost like if you didn't have book divisions, you would think, yeah, this is just the next chapter in the book of Luke. And that's, uh, again, the way to think about what we're picking up on right now. We are going, to, we just last week we were looking at Luke 24, and now we're looking at kind of like the next words that Luke had to say, Acts chapter 1, about what was going on. So that's just a good way to put together uh, and think about how these texts work together. Again, last week Jesus said uh, that his, uh, let, me, let me just show you some of the themes that are very similar. Uh, we said that, that uh, Jesus said, look, the Old Testament was about me. And then he says this, he says, preaching to the nations, we said last week, preaching to the nations is part of the fulfillment. And let me re read Luke uh, 24, 47. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his names to all nations. Right? So that's how Jesus ends that, that Luke passage we were looking at. Go to the nations with the gospel. And he, he doesn't just leave it there. He says to the 11 and the people that were there with him. So he says to a, a bunch of people who are Christians, basically. Right? He says to the, those who are really followers of him, right? he says to them, and you are witnesses. And behold, I am spending, sending the, Holy, the, the promise of my father upon you. This is Luke uh, 24, 49. But stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. So basically, the way that the, this book is ending there, the book of Luke is ending, is you're supposed to be a witness, all of you, not just the 11. Some people want to say, oh, it's just the 11. They were supposed to. No, he's, he's saying it to the 11 and those who were gathered with them and anybody really who at, at that time happened to, you know, in God's providence, be there. But the... the, the uh, instructions are broader than just the 11. And he's saying, you are all witnesses and you need to go out. Now you all wait. And by the way, it wasn't just the, the apostles that got the Holy Spirit. Uh, all those who were truly converted uh, got the Holy Spirit. So you wait for the Holy Spirit. So there's a real sense, though, that you're all supposed to go out. That is all the true Christians. And you're supposed to go out not in your own power, but in the power I'm going to send. I'm going to send the powerful spirit to live inside of you. <laughs> and you, empowered by the spirit, will now go out with the word. Right, that's the way the book of Acts ends, or I mean, the book of Luke ends, and then the book of Acts just starts at the same place. Starts at really almost the same place. Acts chapter one, then, right in verses four and five. Uh, While staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Again, he's it's just picking right up, isn't he? Right? He's saying, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You'll get the Holy Spirit just a few days from now. The, the Father promised the Holy Spirit, you'll get the Holy Spirit very soon. Right? And so, uh, just before Jesus returns to his Father, just before he ascends back up into heaven, he says these words in Acts uh, 1.8 probably familiar to you, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And again, that's just a repeating of what he was saying in Acts chapter 24, right? <laughs> you're going to be witnesses, you're going to get my Holy Spirit, and you're going to go and you're going to take it to the nations. You're going to start, he, he's talking to them in Jerusalem. <laughs> you're going to start where you are. Perhaps with us, he would say, you're going to start in Wake Forest, right? And then you're going to go out from there, right? And so it's just a, uh, just a keep going, right? Keep, keep taking the word out. And I think a good reading of the book of Acts is that's what we see happening. Just keep taking it out further and further, right? And Paul's ambition was to continue to take Christ to further and further regions where Christ had not been preached. And so uh, this, again, is what's going on there in the book of Acts. And Luke is recording, though... What was important to the Lord, right? The Lord had said his death and resurrection was important. It was the fulfillment of the Old Testament story. The Lord said repentance and forgiveness of sins being proclaimed, that matters to me. Uh, the Lord said that you're to be witnesses, right? But not in, you're supposed to spread the news. Beginning with where you are, go to the nations. The Lord, that's it. that was important to the Lord. And they were then to depend on God's power, right? Wait for the Holy Spirit, all of this is making sense to you, I hope. Wait for the Holy Spirit. But not, not surprisingly then, how did they wait? Well, they waited in a, if they're supposed to depend on the power of the Holy Spirit, they waited in a sense in a posture of dependence, which we would call posture of prayer. 
Right. How were they waiting? They could have said, well, let's just all sit around. Let's, you know, maybe, maybe we'll take a nap and get ready. And instead, they were actually waiting in a posture of prayer. Look at verses 12, uh, Acts 1, beginning in verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near, was near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had to enter, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer. Right? <laughs> now, why would they pray? I mean, the, the Lord said the, the Spirit's coming. Do they, you know? But, they, but they're praying about the things that the Lord said he was going to do. The Lord said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And they're like, let's, let's pray about that. Right? <laughs> the Lord's going to give us his Holy Spirit. So we don't have a record of the actual prayer itself, but we can imagine knowing these are the things that matter to the Lord and you wait for me. They're praying, Lord, help us. Lord, help us to uh, have your Holy Spirit. Help us to do the things you've left us here to do. And again, I think if all, all we had... Um, was Acts chapter 1, you may not know the content of the preaching. In just a minute, I'm going to take you to Acts chapter 4, where we get a hint of some of the content of the preaching, and it is in line with what I've just been saying. It's in line with, it will help us to be bold witnesses, but again, let's save that for just a couple minutes. What we first have then in Acts chapter 1 is just people who basically said, okay, the Lord's left us here to do stuff, and Lord, help us to do stuff, and a posture of prayer was just the instinct. The instinct was, we better pray about this, we better pray for the Lord uh, to send his spirit, and we better pray that, that, that we are ready to go because that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to spread the gospel. And in Acts chapter 2 and 3, we see that what the Lord had promised happened. The Holy Spirit comes, Pentecost happens, 3,000 are saved in one day. They go about preaching, they're preaching in Solomon's porch in chapter 3. And then when we get to chapter 4, uh, the, the church continues to grow. That is, more and more people are being saved. Peter and John have been powerfully preaching, right? Uh, they are now arrested, and they're brought before a council. And at this point, uh, in Acts chapter 4, we know that 5,000 people have been converted, right? So we've got lots of people being saved in a very short period of time. And the Lord is doing wonderful things. And the council members say, well, how have you done all that you've done? One of the things that the Lord had done through them was healed, healed a person. But how have you done what you have done, they're asking. And they say, Acts chapter 4, verses 10 through 12, let it be known to all of you and to all of the church of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this man... Or by him, this man is standing before you. Again, the man who had been healed. Uh, standing well before you. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so they just begin, right, uh, called in. They just continue to preach, right? There's no other way to be saved. How did you heal this guy? Actually, I don't want to talk about how I healed this guy. I mean, I, I can tell you uh, it was Jesus, but let me tell you, <laughs> there's no other way for you to be saved. All right? Let, let's, let's not dwell on the healing here. Let's, let's dwell on your soul. Uh, let's dwell on the fact that you could, and that you should, you must, come, because there's no other way for you to be saved. Well, uh, the, the, uh, the, this is where we have that famous verse, chapter 4, verse 13, where they say, well, they, they perceived that these men had been with Jesus, <laughs> right? They, they knew. <laughs> by the way they talked, by the way they cared, by the way they passionately shared the gospel, they could tell these men had been with Jesus. And, but they nevertheless say, look, this is trouble, and they say, we want to stop this. They're, he's, they're preaching something contrary to what the religious leaders had been teaching. And they said, we're sternly warning you, don't, don't preach. Don't preach this gospel. Don't preach Jesus Christ, right? And... Uh, Peter and John say, we're not, well, uh, this is their response, right? Don't, don't preach the gospel. Don't, don't talk about Jesus anymore. Uh, then chapter 4, verse 19. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge, right? You're telling me to not preach. Now, God is telling me to preach. <laughs> so I have to figure out who I'm going to listen to. And then verse 20, it says, but we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard, right? And so they basically, right, the council says, don't preach. And they're like, I think we're going to. We can't help it. We're going we're gonna to preach. Right? Recognizing bad things could happen to them. And actually to some of them, bad things did happen to them. But it didn't keep them from preaching the gospel. Because they, they were so convinced that this is news that had to be shared. And they had remembered that their Lord had said, go talk about it. <laughs> right? It, it was a charge. It was a command. Go 
talk to people about, about this. Proclaim forgiveness of sins through repentance, right? There's salvation in nobody else but Jesus. That's what they've been left to do. And so they just said, well, I mean, we're going to go ahead and do it. And the council let them go, right? Released them, told them to be quiet. And then we find, what do we find the Christians doing at the, after that? Well, they turn to prayer again. It's just a wonderful way that they, their lives have just been threatened, as it were. Their, their, their safety has just been threatened. And then the first thing they do is they basically say, well, we just told them we're going to preach. We, we better pray. Uh, we need God's help here. And so in chapter 4, beginning verse 24, it says, And when they heard it, they lifted up their voices together to God. Right? This is the, the, those who are gathered praying together. Right? Lifted up their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and everything in them. So they begin to basically immediately go to prayer, right? They have the Holy Spirit. You might say, well, you've got the Holy Spirit. Why do you need to pray now? Because people who are saved and have the Holy Spirit, who are trying to do the work that God has given them to do, pray and talk to their Lord about the work the Lord has given them to do. Saying, Lord, help me. Help me to do the work you've given me to do. I don't know if you've ever felt like that when you thought, I need to share my faith with my uh, coworker and I don't feel like doing it. Have you thought to pray about that? I'm feeling a little bit cowardly today. <laughs> I don't want to talk to them about that because I'm afraid what they might think. Have you thought to pray about evangelizing your neighbor? Right? And so here they are in the middle of uh, just being, being um, they, they, they recognize that the Lord is, is powerful, and yet they're saying, Lord, help us. Uh, we are trying to do, work, do the work you've left us here to do, but we need your help to do the work you've left us here to do. Uh, he recognizes that, that God has been powerfully working, so they, they sort of rehearse. And I think this is a helpful thing. Rehearse the way that God's power achieves what he intends to achieve, right? That, that's helpful to you because you're, you need to remember that as you're trying to encourage yourself to pray uh, and to evangelize your neighbor, the Lord uses this sort of thing, right? So it's good to rehearse the way that the Lord uses pe weak people who faithfully do what God calls them to do to achieve his ends. It's good to sort of reflect on God being powerful and God achieving his works and his will in this world. And there's a bit here uh, going on how uh, we're rehearsing in this prayer about how God has accomplished his will in Jesus, uh, verses 27 and 28. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. So we recognize that even in, the, even in the death of Jesus Christ, it was the Lord's plan that was being worked out here. So he's, he's talking to a sovereign God. That's how he starts the prayer. The death of Jesus, that was part of God's plan. right? And he, but he continues to pray as we end this section then. Look, but I know everything that's happened, even, the death, even what looked like a failure, even what looked like defeat, the death of Jesus was part of your plan. And he was raised again victorious. That's, that's salvation in what Christ has done. And now I'm asking you, God, can you make me bold? Right Now, they had just been bold, hadn't they? <laughs> they, they had just said, somebody just told them to be quiet, and they're like, we're going to talk about it anyway. That's pretty bold. But then they get away, and they're like, I, I want to keep being this bold, and I'm not going to keep myself being this bold. I don't know if you think that your evangelistic witness, uh, bold proclamation with, with humility and kindness and just, just saying it just the right way is going to happen in your own strength, but I hope you don't rely on you. I hope you recognize you need God's help for this, and this is again what uh, the apostles here and what, what we see John and Paul praying for here in Acts chapter 4. They prayed in verse 29, now Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. And again, I just think that's a great prayer. If you don't pray for your own boldness, I mean, the lack of boldness is, pro is probably the answer to why we don't share our faith as much as we think we ought to. <laughs> but the presence of it certainly would be, in, in God's uh, way of answering prayer, a, a, a way toward help, helping us be more faithful. And here we've got bold men praying for more boldness. <laughs> and if bold men pray for more boldness, then the less bold like us ought to be praying for more boldness. Isn't that true? And we see, though, that the Lord answers that prayer, Acts 4.31 now. And when they had prayed, the place was, uh, in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So again, the Lord answered. And so uh, what we then need to see here is that um, these people recognize their own weakness. They recognized their own need for God's strength. And in part that came by getting the Holy Spirit. But now having the Holy Spirit, they didn't say, well, now we'll take it from here. 
<laughs> now having a spirit-filled people said, we still need boldness. And again, they continued to pray. But what was the agenda of their prayer? How did, they, how did they figure out what to pray about? And I just want to say, well, they prayed about the things that God told them to do. Like, the, the things God told them to do, they thought, okay, well, he's our God. <laughs> he told us to do it. So that's, that's our job. And so now, uh, help us to do what you told us to do. Like, that's just a good way to form your own prayer list. Right? God's purposes in, for them then became their concern. And it really was the center of their prayers. Right? They didn't say, well, we just got out of prison, great. Hey, Lord, can you provide a good vacation place for us because we were just in this hard situation? <laughs> no. They, they had both faithfully proclaimed and they still had proclaiming to do. And so help proclaiming was the thing they needed to pray about because that's still the thing the Lord was calling them to do. And prayer, they prayed something, honestly, because they wanted it. Yes, the Lord wanted it. But because they loved the Lord and because they wanted what the Lord wanted, it was what they wanted. Right? They didn't say, well, I don't really want to share, but you want me to share, so give me boldness. <laughs> no, I think, in God's kindness, uh, the Lord they loved said he wanted this, and he wanted them to do this, and he had worked in them as it were they wanted to do this. And I think prayer happens best that way. Not praying about the things that we don't want to do, but we know that we should do, but praying that God would help work in us to want to do the things that he wants us to do. And where this sermon is heading, and we'll pick this back up later, is, is there anything that God wants us to do? Like Stony Hill, is he just like, no, just keep hanging out, don't really do much, you know, don't get into trouble. Is that, is that, what, he's, is that what he wants us to do? He's, he's left this church here so that we just wouldn't get into trouble and have somewhere to show up once a week. Or does he have work that he wants us to do? And he, honestly, he wants us not only to do it, but to seek his help that we would both want to do it and then seek his help that we would be enabled to do it. I think that's where the Lord means to, for, for us to go. Right? But our prayer list then, again, is in a sense made by the Lord. I get it, we have certain particular concerns that pop up, that don't show up in the Bible. And, and those we pray about as well. But I think at, at our best, our prayer list is significantly looking like the kinds of things the Lord has told us he wanted us to be doing. Well, uh, secondly then, and, and perhaps briefly, there, there was an impulse to pray. What we see in the early church is an impulse to pray. Uh, when there's a situation... Uh, that came up, they prayed about it. So I, I, I spent kind of a longer time on two texts. I'm now going to just kind of read off a few texts. Not all the texts on prayer, by the way. This is, again, I can't, can't cover the entire book of Acts here. But in this section, I want to quickly point to several texts in Acts that show that it is the impulse of Christians to pray uh, at all times and in many situations. Now, in Acts chapter 12, uh, James has been, had been killed and Peter had been arrested and was now in prison. What did they do? Well, in Acts 2, 5, so Peter was kept in prison and earnest prayers for him was made to God by the church. <laughs> right? They, they just all got together and their impulse was, what do we do? They thought, oh, there's nothing to be done. We'll just wait. No, no. <laughs> well, they all got together and they said, earnest, earnest, let's earnestly pray. Right? That was their impulse. Uh, in Acts chapter 13, Barnabas and Saul were set, up, set apart for ministry. And in Acts 12, uh, 3, or it means 13, 3, and after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So again, these people were supposed to go out in, in keeping with God's commands. Go out and spread the gospel. Well, these two guys are going to go. Well, let's pray about that. Let's set them apart. Let's pray for them that they might, the, the Lord might bless them individually as Christians and then their ministry. In Acts chapter 14, when they were appointing elders, they prayed about that. Acts 14, 23. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church, so there was elders uh, in every church, they basically, how did they appoint them? They appointed them with, their, uh, with prayer and fasting. In Acts chapter 20, Paul departs from the Ephesian elders. He charges them to live a particular way. And then when he leaves them, he prays with them all in, in verse 36. 
And then again, when he finally leaves in chapter 21 to go to Jerusalem, there we see he also, uh, as he's going down to leave, in chapter 21, verse 5, and kneeling down on the beach, we prayed. And so again, we just see uh, it, 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 here, one of the things that we're uh, just making a few observations, prayer happened, as it were, uh, at the time the need was known, right? So there's a need. Uh, everyone who... Who, who, who loves the same Lord and wants the same will done, let's all just get together and pray. So there's a sense in which pray, prayer should happen. You don't, you don't have to make it an event. Now you can, and I think they oftentimes did, but sometimes you can just go, well, the four of us are here. We, we could pray about that, right? Prayer happens, right? But there are prayers in keeping with the things we think the Lord wants to do and then with the people that are gathered at that moment, right? And so, but it was an impulse to pray, right? It wasn't like... I got an idea, make sure to jot this down, because when we all get to the prayer meeting, we'll pray for it then. Now, I think that they did meet to pray, right? We can get to that in a few minutes, but I just want to say, if you only pray when you come to church, you're probably not praying enough, right? Uh, you should pray where you, when the need arises, perhaps with the people around you that you can pray with, right? Prayer happened with those who shared the same faith, and again, the same concern for doing God's will. And it was, we should just notice, then the will of God that was being prayed, right? Help these elders do this work they're supposed to do. Help these missionaries go spread the gospel where they're going. Uh, make us bold that we might share, the, share our faith, right? It was whatever God had told them to do, that's what they're going to pray about. And again, I think we do well to let God's word and God's will inform our prayer list. It was seeking God's help to do God's work. And prayer then happened with a sense of their own weakness. We are weak and he is strong. And so we pray to the one who is strong that he might empower and strengthen those of us who are weak to do the things he's called us to do. And again, he gave us the Holy Spirit because we couldn't do it in our own strength. But he also calls us to pray that we might live moment by moment in, in seeking to carry out his will. We might do the whole bit of it, not thinking, well, we've got all we need now. No, every moment we need him. And so we pray about these things. This is where the sermon gets a fair bit topical. I just want to like point to a few things that have helped me in my own prayer journey a little bit, and it will be relatively brief. Uh, I've been helped to either through Christian books or just being directed to pray what's in the Bible. Like that's been really helpful to me over just over the course of my lifetime. You know, if I go back 25 years and I'm sitting there, like just kind of clueless about all of this. You know, how could I improve, or how could I pray more consistent with the way I think the Lord wants me to pray? I think. Uh, one book that was really helpful to me, it used to be called A Call to Spiritual Reformation. I think it's now called Praying with Paul, but it's a book by uh, D.A. Carson. And what he commends, though, is he looks at a lot of the prayers of Paul uh, in the epistles, and he says, look how Paul is praying for the people. And basically, if you want the short version of the way Paul prays for the people is he prays for them. Uh, we might just say God's will, <laughs> Uh, or we might uh, summarize it in a different way, that they would become mature, deeply rooted, strong spiritually, right? So let me just give you one example, and I won't take time to expand it, but just notice how he's praying, right, for people that are also already walking with the Lord. I want them to, be, I want them to go deeper in their faith. I want them to be more steadfast in their faith. I want them to love Jesus more. Right, look, uh, and I'm going to just read quickly then from Philippians 1, 9 through 11. This is Paul's prayer for the church at Philippi, right? It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. And again, I'd love to spend time on that. And I, I believe probably I have spent preached this text and many other texts like this. These are wonderful ways to be taught how to pray. So you, you pray for your children this way. If you don't have children, pray for your pastor this way this week. Just, just go to Philippians 1, 9 through 11 and just pray that for me a couple days this week. And you would be doing me a great service, <laughs> right? Uh, but again, when I seek to pray for you, I, I pray along these lines, right? I, I want you, I want your love for the Lord and each other to, to grow, right? I want to abound more and more, right? You might say, well, I already do love. Well, sure you do some, <laughs> but I want it to abound, and we don't abound in love all the time like we should. So this is a legitimate prayer for you to pray for just about anybody at any point in time. Help them to grow in a love for the Lord. Help them to grow in a love for neighbor. 
right? And he also says, so they'll be pure and blameless, filled with the fruit of righteousness. I want you to be holy. <laughs> you should pray for my holiness. Make my pastor holy. Not because there's no holiness in me, but because I'm not ho perfectly holy, right? And this is the way we pray for each other. Keep, keep him from sin. Keep her from sin. This is probably the way you pray for your kids when they go off. Keep them, keep them go off to college or go off to the work, move out of the house. Just, <laughs> may they walk with the Lord and not get into filth, right? Um, and and, and he, he ends with, to the glory and praise of God. May they live. May, may the pastor live. May, may the deacon live. May the elder live for the, for the glory of God. May the Sunday school teacher live for the glory of God. May the, you know, wh whoever, every, every person. There's, we would all pray for each other like this. This is a good way, again, to sort of reform your prayer life. <laughs> uh, there's all kinds of things you can pray for me about, but these, again, my own joy in the Lord, my love for the Lord, my love for you, pray that the Lord would help me love you better. I need prayer for that, right? Okay. Uh, just uh, other books, I could name other books, but lots of different books are out there, and I, I'll name some, I'll give, if you want to ask me afterwards, I can point you to a few others, that basically teach you to pray the Bible, or teach you to pray a psalm. And these have just been super helpful to me to, to reset uh, my, what I ask God to do, I'm asking God to do God's will. <laughs> the more I pray in keeping with the scriptures, the more I'm not saying, hey God, I got a few ideas, do these, to God, you've got some great ideas, uh, and help me to get on board with these and want these and pray for these because your will is better than mine, and I by your help, now want your will done, and I'm going to pray about your will. I think it's also good to talk about a time of prayer. The book of Acts, we're not going to have time for it today, but there were times of prayers, places of prayer that were mentioned in the book of Acts. That's fine. Uh, I, I remember as I began, as the Lord was working on me to work on my prayer life, I remember a quote that stuck out to me. It was uh, this guy, you know, Martin Luther. I was going to say this guy, Martin Luther, but you, you're familiar. Uh, Martin Luther, I, I couldn't actually find the exact quote, but many places it's reported he said this, so I, I assume he did say it, but I couldn't find the direct quote. Uh, it was about how, remember, how, when we think of Martin Luther, I don't know how you think of him, he got a lot done. <laughs> he was very busy. He had many opportunities to teach and, 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 and uh, minister in God's name, and his days were probably just chock full. And, uh, and the way that he approached a day that was just chock full, which is a lot of them, is he would say this, I have so much to do, to, to do today that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. And sometimes, isn't it interesting, his day was so packed that he knew to get through, he's going to have to talk with the Lord to get through it. And we think, my day is so full, the only way to get through it is to not read my Bible or pray. So I just pray that the Lord will work in us, th that contrary instinct. If I've got a lot going on, all the more do I need God's power to get it done. I must pray about it, instead of, well, I'm so busy, maybe I'll pray later in the week. Right, so... Uh, I don't know how to get you there. The Lord is still working to get me there, but I just hold that out to you as I think a helpful thing. I think setting an hour of prayer, a time of prayer, is a good idea. Uh, but I also believe the Bible talks about praying without ceasing, right? 1 Thessalonians 5.17. And once, uh, I, read a, I did read a book on that, and I'll tell you about it later if you want to ask me about it. That's also true. Both are true. I, you, you should set a time, a time for prayer, but honestly, pray throughout the day. And once I saw that, I was like, I, you began, I don't pray, I mean, I'd love to pray even more than I do, but you know, pray while you're driving. Now, sometimes you need to pray because you're about to lose your temper and you need to pray to calm yourself down, right? But pray while you're driving. Pray, uh, pray, pray as you're walking to your next meeting. Uh, pray as you are fixing lunch for your family. Right? Just pray while you're doing it. Uh, this week, uh, I was able to go uh, to a conference and hear some good preaching. And I, I, I'm not doing anything other than just telling you how I was doing that. Like when I sat down to listen to the sermon, immediately I would just say this, like what, when the sermon started, Lord, help me to listen carefully now. Right? I didn't have to stop listening to do that. It's just a sentence. And then just go to listening. Right? So, so praying in the middle of it doesn't mean, okay, i got to check out for 10 minutes. we got to get all the these and thous and thou knowest, O Lordest, in, in, in the middle of the sermon. Right? You just like, like or, or if it was on... There was one. Remember, I just told you to pray that I would love you better. There was one place where they were challenging pastors to really love their church. And I said, Lord, make me like that. Right? It's just a, it's a, it's a quick prayer that says, 
I, whatever the word of God is saying, I need to be that. And it's just a quick, I didn't say it out loud, right? Just in my own mind, Lord, help me to be like that. Help me to love Jesus. Right? So, so as the, as the, as the, maybe right now the Lord is pushing on you to be more in prayer. And you just quickly in your mind say, Lord, help me to pray more. Right? And then you're just ba- right back with the sermon. You don't have to check out of the sermon. Now, I'm, you can. If you need to pray a lot, go ahead. But I'm just trying to say that way of just kind of moving through your day. Right? I'm in the middle of a, of a conversation and it's escalating. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure I'm making it escalate. Lord, help me to calm down and help me to be wise here. Right? I didn't have to stop the conversation. I didn't have to tell the other person, you're the problem. I'm going to pray for you and me here now. Like, I mean, you can't even do that, but don't, don't make it all about them. Just yell out to the Lord, Lord, uh, I'm blowing it uh, right now. I'm in the middle of blowing it. Help me. Right? And then just, and then move on with your, then move on with what you're doing. Right? But there's just this recognition that all throughout the day, you are blowing it. <laughs> uh, you are not quite, you know, being that faithful witness that you meant to be or you were not you know and and that's fine but we just kind of quickly call out a prayer to the lord all throughout the day and and that in that way perhaps is the best way to understand what does it mean to pray without ceasing just all throughout the day i'm supposed to be living for the lord i'm supposed to be living for god's glory i'm pretty sure what i'm doing right now is not glorifying god lord help me lord bless this person through me this person is coming after me and I want to say hurtful things to them. Help me to think about a way to be a blessing to them instead. Because right now I want to say something hurtful to them because they just said something hurtful to me. Lord, help me. Right? And so they're just quick prayers. But you have countless opportunities in a day to blow it or to ask God that you wouldn't. And so these are just ways that we try to work on this. Again, I think the church's impulse, though, was to pray, right? Right? They, there's a situation, let's pray about it. There's a situation, let's pray about it. Is that our impulse? And if it's not, let's get back to it. Their impulse was to pray in difficult times and times of need or just when they gathered. And God has called, uh, had called, has called us to do the same, right? That we might be those who depend on him. So back to that question and this will be the end of it here has does God have any purposes among us and I would just say yes <laughs> he didn't just save us and say you know just kind of do some good entertainment keep yourself kind of out of trouble till I come back no <laughs> he has called us uh, to to preach the gospel because some people maybe in this room right now are not saved some of our children have not yet professed faith in Christ Some people have been coming here a long time and have not trusted in Christ. God means for us to be holy, and some of us are not taking that very seriously, and we need to pray about that. God wants us to be mature, and some people are immature, and the the verse that says, by now you should be teachers, and I'm still teaching any of the basics, and that's true of some of us, and the Lord wants us to be mature, and maybe that's... The the Lord has purposes. I'm not trying to get on any person about any one thing. I just want to say the Lord has purposes. Your maturity, you being equipped to do ministry. How how is the Lord Lord using your past five years in church to equip you? And how are you now actually in some way being useful to encourage others with your life? Because that's God's plan for you. Right? And, and at this point, I'm not just kind of like talking about ways that you fail. I'm talking about things that we should be make matters of prayer. Lord, make me holy. Lord, make me mature. <laughs> help, help me to spend some time on maturing in the faith with your word and prayer this week. Right? Lord, help me to proclaim my faith this week. Lord, part of the problem is I don't even want to share my faith, so work on me with that. Lord, help me. I'm, supp- I'm supposed to want to share my faith more than I do, so help me to want to share my faith more. And Lord, then when you give me an opportunity, make me bold. Right? But we're just taking God's word, setting our agenda for our prayer life. Help me to take the gospel to the nations. Or whatever, whatever way that would happen. Either you're going to the nations or you're going to pray about it more. You're going to be more fervent in prayer that the gospel would go to the nations. Or you're going to be more regular in your giving so that you can support the... Like, I don't know how the Lord wants you to think about getting into the gospel to all nations, but he wants that done and he wants us to be part of that. And I'm not telling you exactly what way in which you're supposed to do it, but there's all kinds of ways to work at it. And to pray about it. And again, the concerns of God become the concerns of the many. 
But th really, honestly, the concerns of the many should become the prayers of the many. We should all be praying about this. And uh, I encourage us now then to engage, and we do this a bit around here, corporate prayer. I think corporate prayer happens sometime, I mean, corporate prayer at its base is basically one person prays, not his own prayer. So like when I do the pastoral prayer here, I'm not praying about uh, for me with you guys all listening, right? I'm, I'm praying for us, right? I'm praying... Right, it's, right. We, we pray about all kinds of things around here. You give requests, I pray for those. Uh, we pray for other churches around here. Uh, we pray for our government leaders. Uh, we pray for um, that we would have assurance of salvation for those who are really trusting in Christ. Uh, we pray for uh, the gospel. We pray for a nation. Uh, we pray for a ministry in our church. But these are all concerns that I think we all share. And when I pray, you are, I think, affirming... These are the things that we want. Now, that can happen with, in this big service like this, and it also happens in what we might have called the old-time prayer meeting. Right? The same thing happens there. There maybe somebody stands up and prays here, and we all pray with that person. And then, then a few minutes later, John gets up and he prays, and we all pray. We're all affirming that prayer. So, affirm, so corporate prayers happens in many ways. One of the things, though, that I'm more convinced of getting pressed on and thinking that perhaps the Lord would have us to begin to renew is that part, that part in which... Uh, I'm not the only one, and I know this is true, I'm not the only one who wants what God wants for our church. I, I pray, <laughs> oftentimes on behalf of the church, but I'm not the only one. I know you do. And I think it would do you good to hear each other <laughs> say, God, we want these things. Does that make sense? Like, it's good for you to hear me say, God, we want the gospel to go to the nations. But wouldn't it be nice to hear John say that? Wouldn't it be nice to hear Jude say that? Wouldn't it be nice to hear, right, just, just say that, right? And so there's something good about saying we all want it. And actually, it's nice to hear each other say that. And I think that's the way the Lord is sort of pressing on, on me and, and us praying about how to do that. And so uh, just we're going to close here in a couple minutes, uh, just right, really right now. And then uh, we have a couple in, in immediate plans about how we will try to move in the direction of more prayer. But, uh, but we, I think the Lord is kind of stirring us up and we're hopefully stirring us up to uh, make us praying together uh, something we do a little more often. So let's just pray about that first and then we'll close. Thank you, Lord God, that you give us just a real clear understanding about the way that you mean for us to live as your people, of the work you've left us here to do, of the way you mean for us to grow mature in our faith and to invest in each other and to counsel each other and, and to evangelize our neighbor and, uh, and get the gospel to the nations. And the, and, and the things that you would like for us to do are, uh, well, are too big for us individually. Uh, you've given us, though, a church and then sister churches through which we mean to um, walk in obedience to you. But, Lord, we pray uh, that you would both make us take your word seriously and then make your agenda for us the content of our prayer uh, may we together uh, call out to you and together in calling out to you ask that you would do what we know we can't do in our own strength but what we uh, have come to understand you are pleased to do uh, through ordinary folks like us and so we pray that you would make us prayerful about your will uh, and your work in this world we pray these things in Christ's name amen